my name is Lauren Marina Perez and I am the Community Engagement Manager for the San Diego Natural History Museum, also known as the NAP. And I am here doing one of my favorite things today, treasure hunting at the tide pools. One of my favorite places, Cabrillo National Monument, with one of my favorite community partners, Sam Wint. Hi Sam! <laughs> Exactly, to see your face instead of on a Zoom screen. Okay. Um, so Lauren and I are standing here on this sandstone ledge at the edge of land and sea in one of Cabrillo's coolest locations, the Rocky Intertidal Zone. There's only so many scientists in the world and only so many hours in the day, so you might imagine it's hard for them to know if things are changing. And so we, that's where we come in, people like me and you, citizen or community scientists, we can help formal scientists like Sam collect data and help with their research. And one type of data we can collect is what is found when and where. For example, what are we going to find in the tide pools today? Knowing what's found where and when helps paint a picture of an ecosystem frozen in time. And over time, when we look at all those different pictures together, we get a pretty good understanding of how an area or an ecosystem has changed over time and how it stayed the same. For example, if there's a new plant that we find somewhere that we never found before, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we wouldn't know it was new if we didn't have those old pictures to look at and see that this is something new that we need to keep an eye on and monitor to make sure it's not negatively impacting the environment or the ecosystem where we found it. Ecosystems like, you guessed it, the Rocky Intertidal Zone, which is a super special ecosystem for a couple of reasons. First, it's hugely biodiverse which means there are many different species and an abundant number of them that live here and make the tide pools their home. Second, it's one of the most extreme environments to live in on Earth, and that's largely to do with the tidal cycles. When you think about it, right, these are marine organisms, and multiple times a day the tide goes out and they have to deal with factors like wind and sun, right? So here in a minute, we're gonna go on a little treasure hunt. We're gonna go document a lot of these really, really cool uh, this cool biodiversity and check out some of their cool adaptations, the adaptations they had to survive in this really extreme ecosystem. And this is where you come in, right? As we go, we're going to teach you how you can help us document this biodiversity too. species of algae. So it's alive. Yeah, all of this is alive. Wow, so that is like such a great reminder just if we stop to pause and look, we're surrounded by different species of things, different living organisms. Plants and animals are always all around us. Um, it's really especially evident here at the Rocky Intertidal Zone, the tide pools, because there's just life everywhere. It's amazing. Um, and actually this is where citizen scientists, community scientists come in again, like you and me, we can help Sam by documenting all these different species, plants and animals that we come across. Um, one way to do it is to use, there's an app and a website called iNaturalist, that's the letter I followed by naturalist. And what you do is you download it and you upload pictures of what you find. And those pictures, people can see them all over the world. And in return, you can see pictures of what people have found all over the world. You can go explore the Amazon rainforest if you want to get comfort of your own home, which is really cool. Super. And then scientists like Sam can pull those observations, like identify them, tell you what you're seeing, which is awesome, pull them into their work, and use them. So you don't never even have to meet anyone in the world. And I love to use it when I'm taking walks in my neighborhood. I don't have to be at the tide pools necessarily to find life, like just stopping and looking at one bush find a ton of different insects on it um, and I love looking at them and using iNaturalist to identify them because in the beginning I didn't know any of the insects and now I'm slowly learning all my weird insects in my neighborhood which I love. Yeah it's absolutely a great tool to both learn about your environment and to help scientists with their research right. 
Um, so let's try it out, shall we? Yeah. I've got my handy dandy smartphone somewhere, oh, right here. Figure out which pocket it was in. And um, you can also use a digital camera, that works as well. So let me just open it up here. Give me one second. And you look in your apps and you look for the app that is the um, white background with a green bird on it. That's iNaturalist, you click on that. And then a screen will come up uh, that will have either a green plus sign or a little um, camera at the bottom of your screen. And so you click on that and this is how you're gonna take your observation. So I'm gonna click on take a photo and my camera pops up. So let's see, I am gonna take a photo of, ooh, let's take a picture of this circular tentacled creature that's attached to the rock down here. Great, got it. And then you can click the uh, blue check mark. Excellent, and then a bunch of different fields will come up. And what we want is the field that's directly underneath your photograph that says, what did you see? There is a dotted box uh, or dashed box with a question mark in it. So we're gonna click on that. Now, if you're in a place where you have internet connection or you have Wi-Fi, iNaturalist will actually help you identify it. It'll make suggestions. Um, or if you happen to know what the species is, you can actually just go ahead and type the species in there. So I know, I happen to know that this is a sunburst sea anemone. And again, if you're offline, it's totally okay. It'll upload it later once you get back into a place where you can. So you're gonna click on that. Sunburst sea anemone, perfect. And then you click the green check mark and voila, you have your first entry into the iNaturalist database. And this is where other observers, like scientists or community scientists like you, can go in and take a look at your entry. They can actually verify um, what you observed. Um, they can even leave notes and comments on it. It's pretty cool stuff. So Lauren, I dare you to touch that sunburst sea in it. Uh, I was worried you were gonna say that. <laughs> okay. Have you ever touched one of these before? I, you know, it's been a long time. Okay, yeah. so this is gonna be an experience for you. Okay. So go ahead and try to touch it on its Kind of the stringy blue-green tentacles there at the edge. Ooh, Whoa! It's closing up on me! Oh, wow. So, Lauren, what did that feel like to you? It felt kind of um, like sticky, like it was holding on. Yeah. Yeah, so actually that stickiness that you're feeling, kind of like tape, oh. is actually that sea anemone stinging you. Yeah. But don't worry. Okay. <laughs> it can't hurt us, right? <laughs> So sea anemones have, I wouldn't have told you to touch it, right, if it could hurt you. <laughs> yeah, I would not do that to you, um, So sea anemones actually have these little special capsules called nematocysts, and in each nematocyst is a little barb that contains poison in it. And if you were some of the sea anemones prey, like a little fish, that barb would come out and it would paralyze it. It would incapacitate its prey, right? But we're too big, so it just feels like stickiness to us. And you also made an observation there. What was the other thing you observed when you touched it? Uh, probably it was like closing up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it looks like closing. You're right, it does close up like that because if you look closely at the sea anemone, it looks like there's a little disc in the center. Mm -hmm. That's its mouth. Its mouth is actually in the center of its body. So it's, it stays out here nice and open. A little fish comes along, it touches its tentacle and it goes whoop, swings it, incapacitates it, and then brings it in to its mouth so it can be devoured. Really cool. So that sea yeah. anemone didn't didn't know what you were, right? Something touched it. It just yeah. closed automatically. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Some of my relatives. <laughs> just bringing you in, whether you want it or not. <laughs> I hope their mouth isn't in the center of their body. Uh, they should go get so. checked out yeah. by a doctor if that's the case. Um, are you ready to explore some more? Laura? I would love to. That's so fun. We found something really cool. Lauren, check this out. a little tiny sea slug that is a rosy nudibranch. Oh my god, it's so cute! Isn't it cute? Oh. And that's, they don't get much bigger than that. Wow. Um, and they are most
most nudibranchs are a bright color to warn off predators. Why do you think they might want to warn off uh, predators? Oh, are they like my little friend over there, the anemone? But do they sting? <laughs> a venom or something? <laughs> They're warning off predators because they are toxic. Ah. So to eat most nudibranchs anyways, not all species, but most are. So uh, they're saying, hey, it's that flash coloration, right? That's saying like, hey, back off. You don't want to eat me. Just like monarch butterflies, right? They're kind of like bright orange saying, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. Same thing with our little nudibranch friends down here. Well, I'm going to take a picture of them. I'm going to put it on iNaturalist. Perfect. Yeah, you know, and get in there and get some shots. Um, and I don't want to touch them, but I do want to just put like, my finger kind of there for a little bit of scale. So the person that's looking at this on the other side of the computer can see just how big it is. One more angle. Oh my god, it's so cool. I've never seen so they, you often find them in seagrass, this is long stringy green stuff that you can see around here, or in algae. You can probably tell that this time of year is the perfect time to go tide pulling. Look at this amazing negative low tide here. That is late fall, winter, and spring. Uh, if you come at another time of year, our low tides happen in the middle of the night. So I definitely recommend that you check a local tide chart if you're heading down to Carrillo's Tide you might be tight. And do remember to wear appropriate water shoes, appropriate clothing, sunscreen, and bring anything else that might make your time more enjoyable. However, it's important to note that this is a national park, so there is no swimming, collecting, or taking of any kind, right? We want to leave everything here just as you found it for all of these other species to enjoy and for people to enjoy as well. If you want to learn more about Cabrillo's Tide Pools, you can check out our website at nps.gov backslash Cabrillo. That's nps, as in National Park Service, dot gov, as in government, backslash C-A-B-R-I-L-L-O. Thank you so much for having me here today, Sam. It has been wonderful. The Tide Pools are really an extraordinary place and we're so lucky to have them. We're really lucky to have people like Sam that work hard to keep them safe and healthy for all of us to enjoy. I'd also like to thank our cameraman, Andrew, who's behind the camera. He also works for the National Park Service and the National Park Service in general. It's just an amazing system and we're so lucky to have it. And I just want to let you guys know that even if you can't get to the tide pools, that's not a problem because you can still participate in community science. Go on our website to check out projects. We have projects on our website at sdnhm, that's for San Diego Natural History Museum, .org, and then backslash community science. There you can see all sorts of cool projects you can get involved with, run by our researchers at the museum, but also researchers in other places as well. And there's a really cool project um, that even if you can't get to the tide pools, even if you can't leave your house, you can participate in. That's called Never Home Alone, and that one isn't run by the museum, but it's still really fun and you should get involved with it.